I, I would say like when, and you've been through this too, you get an interview, right? Or a general, like, why are you a good director? And that's just such a hard, like, you don't ask an actor, why are you a good actor, right? Why? Right. <laughs> um, and you have to toot your horn a little bit. Luckily, we have managers and agents, right, who hopefully toot for us. But we got to be hustling all the time and, and selling yourself. The one thing I think I have is I have done, and I'm constantly told this by crew members, which I appreciate. They're like, wait, you know camera, you know the technical, you know the lighting, you know how to deal with the showrunners, you know how to deal with the network, you know how to mm -hmm. deal with talent. Everything I've done, I never set out like you asked how I got those jobs. They're totally random. But right. every single thing has given me a learning, another tool that I put in my toolbox that I can use and whip out. And you never know when it's going to happen. You know, you never know when you're going to need, oh, I did live television. I know how to handle that right now. Right. I never set out for it. I don't know if I'll ever do it again, but I, I have that skill set now. I hold on to that. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Visit PeteChapman.com to get your official podcast merch, hoodies, hats, jackets, mugs, and other swag, and learn more about your host. All right, people, welcome to episode 57 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. This episode will be starring none other than Mr. Jonathan Judge. He's an American film and TV director, best known for, also a producer, known for Blues Clues, The Naked Brothers Band, Young Sheldon, The Really Loud House. He's got so many credits that I could, I could talk for days in this intro. But one of the most important things is that, and not most important, most impressive things is that he, I believe, is has got the best ratio for pilot to series, somewhere around 15 or 16 episodes. And we will get to that in our conversation in, in a short bit. But for anybody out here trying to get into the pilot game, that is remarkable. So we'll find what kind of magic he's putting on his television when he gets in that director's chair in our conversation in a little bit. In the meantime, though, I am happy to report, and this is not news, it is not breaking. I am, you know, a week after, or almost a week after, but SAG has come to a tentative agreement with the AMPTP that has been sent from their board to, or has been sent to the board, and then they will, if they choose to present it to the membership, pass it on, and a vote for ratification will happen. So, we are hopefully days, you know, away from an official end to this strike of, uh, or the second strike of this labor, hot labor summer, as some people are calling it, that began on May 2nd of this year. So uh, I'm just happy to be even turning the corner and expecting that um, a return to work is possible. There was a lot of uh, negotiation that went into this. Uh, a lot of hard fought terms. I've yet to read the SAG agreement. I will in full. So I have a better understanding of it as I urge anyone working professionally in this industry to do, whether you're in front of or behind the camera, to have a sense of what the studios are trying to protect, what they're willing to uh, negotiate on, what they think our value is. Because guess what? Next year, IATSE will be back at the table and in three years. So will the DGA, the WGA, and SAG-AFTRA. So stay informed, y'all. It's just like reading the trades. You should read these agreements in full so you're as aware of what's going on in the business, of the legal parts of the business as you are in what's moving, you know, as far as projects. So that's my spiel there. I did put out a call for listener questions, and I will dive in to a few. As always, I save them and I reply to them live. So Tristan Nash, our, our producer and editor, good luck, brother. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be very fluent in how I reply, but let's get into them. Let's see. This is from Jay Hannibald on IG. These are all from IG. When you... Wait, 
looks like he may have two. All right, he has two. Let me let me go to the first one. At Jay Hannibald. Generally speaking, I'd love to hear more about the business side of directing in TV and film. So I feel like I've I've, I've talked about that at length. I feel like most of these interviews are hitting on that. I do have particular episodes that speak to the the psychology and craft or psychology and technique of directing and what it's like as like as a director. So I urge you to go through the episodes and review those. In particular, episode 27 is called Psychology and Technique of Directing. So check that out. But there's so many different people who in our conversations on this podcast get into the day-to-day existence of of what they do on set and also what it's like to have a career. So what they're doing when they're trying to get the next job, what they're doing in between jobs, and also what they did to get to where they are. So I do feel like um, that part is available. Jay Hannibal's next question is, when you have multiple job opportunities to choose from, what factors influence your choice? So in no particular order, what factors influence my choice? How much of a connection I have to that particular show? When and where that show shoots? Who are the people that work on that show? You know, the directors talk to other directors and you just kind of know what the word on the street is. And if there's a show that is a is an environment that's going to be not that welcoming or full of confrontation and debate over everything that goes into making an episode of TV. And if in particular, they're not looking for someone to come in and have a point of view, I will say those go low on my list. Another thing that goes into choosing, you know, uh, for me, I'm also looking at what have I done as far as genre or, or, you know, particular types of scenes. So for instance, like for those of you who follow me on Instagram at Pete Chapman, where these questions came in, I just posted a, a trailer for Dead Boy Detectives, which will be on Netflix. And for which I had the pleasure of directing the season finale, episode eight, 108. And so you know, what was really exciting about that show to me was the fact that I I knew that it was going to be dealing with, it was from a comic book, right? I hadn't done that yet. It was going to have a lot of VFX. It was going to have a lot of stunts and, and we were blowing shit up. You know, these are things that I know I can do, but when you go up for the jobs where you maybe you haven't done that as much as somebody else and you're trying to gain, you know, book an episode in that space, if I can point to the fact that I've done that on another show, it makes each time those types of shows come up in the future an easier, you know, conversation. People can kind of breathe a little easier. And then the other thing for me is, you know, I'm writing projects that have those same elements with stunts, VFX, whatever it might be. And so I get to learn on these shows about things that I'll be applying to my own projects when I get back into the feature film director's chair and also selling some of these ideas that I've been developing for um, a while. So Jay Hannibal, those are my two answers for you. More Patch Please, at More Patch Please. How can actors make the director's job easy? Actors can make the director's job easy by being prepared, obviously, knowing your lines, uh, having a point of view, understanding your character, and also being fluent in how production works. You know, I think that obviously knowing your lines is very clear that, you know, what that does for the onset time. You know, everything about shooting television is is about efficiency. So being prepared is 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 so important. But uh, oh, also having a good a good attitude and being there to collaborate. But I think the the last thing that I mentioned the idea of like understanding what goes into TV production is so important because I've definitely done shows where people do not fully understand the production logistics that go into shooting and it can make for contentious arguments. It can make for unnecessary conversations and it can make for a whole lot of things that can be avoided. I can think of one time on a show where I was working with the scene was a two hander and you start getting a sense of how different actors work and, and where their best performances come, what take that might be, who do you shoot first or whatever. And on this particular show, I was shooting one side of the scene with the actress and I was 
knowing the actor on the other side who was off camera, I was giving him notes, kind of getting him to where I thought the performance should be, but also not taking him to like, you know, a hundred to where I thought it needed to be because I knew that if I did that on her coverage, it would make his performance suffer when he's on camera. So we get her coverage. She gets everything that I was looking for. And if she's prepared, she should be doing what she ha- thinks the character, you know, what this, what the scene calls for from the character. And then when I turned the camera around and we were shooting his part, this actress came to me and was saying, well, he didn't do that on my coverage. And it wasn't that he did a whole new performance, but it was just the nuances were were a little sharper. And, and, and people turn it on. They, they I don't want to say they save it for their coverage, but they they go to, they know it counts a little bit more when they're on camera. Let's just be honest. And so that became an argument because now this actress wanted me to turn the camera back around so she could redo her coverage. And we were also on the last scene before lunch because we were going to do, we were doing splits. So after this scene, we were going to be doing a night shoot and she's asking to turn around asking to redo her coverage and all these things. And it's just like, we can't do that. Number one, there's no time. Number two, this is how almost every scene gets shot to some degree, depending upon the actors you're working with. And then if you were to look at the call sheet, you know, we're going into a night scene after this and we have no wiggle room for what you're requesting. So the job of the actor is to come in and know what they want to do with their performance. And then in my opinion, if you are not in that place, trust that the director has this has the whole scene in mind and is not going to move on from your coverage without getting something that elevates and works for what the scene requires so that was a long-winded kind of answer to that but it goes back to my point like knowing how production works could avoid 10 minutes of going back and forth on something that should have you know, in a perfect world, been understood by both people behind and in front of the camera. So I think it just uh, behooves you to have that understanding because it makes your work more efficient. And I love when I see actors go direct an episode of TV because they end up taking away a whole nother perspective on the actor's role, or at least how they can enhance the overall flow of production by taking what they know about production and applying it to their particular craft. So Let's go to, let's see, Metal Creative Group. My man, Joe Metal, what's your favorite part of the day when directing episodes? I would say that my favorite part of the day when directing an episode of TV, I'm going to get real granular because it it doesn't happen on every show, but my favorite part of directing anything, but TV in particular, because sometimes it, it moves so fast, is when You've designed a shot that really requires all departments to lock in. So I directed an episode of Interior Chinatown, which will uh, be coming to Hulu sometime, I imagine in 2024. It's from the best-selling book by Charles Yu. And I'm directing a scene where I'm going from a flashback to a present moment, and I want to do an in-camera kind of Texas switch where I leave one actor in the present, go find another actor off of a pan. And then I had about nine seconds, maybe 10 for hair, makeup, and actually hair and wardrobe to come to the actor, change her hair, change her wardrobe. So then when I pan back to her, I can be in the flashback that includes the character that I just panned over to. I hope that makes sense. I feel like it did. And so you know, it's uncommon to be on take 10 of anything in television. But when you need like that thing to be perfect, it's really, it's really rewarding to watch all these like super talented craftspeople lock in and find out what they have to do to shave half a second off so we can make this thing work. And so, you know, there was a point where even I was like, I don't know, guys, like, what do we need to do something different? And they're like, no, we'll get it. We'll get it. So, you know, we were able to do that hair change, do that wardrobe change, do the pan off to the other character, come back and find her. And, you know, even the actors have to step out of 
normal actor headspace because they're doing all of this stuff that they do in their trailer right in the moment and then boom, have to be back in character by the time I, I reach my 10 second, you know, return on the pan. So I love those kind of moments. It's just a reminder of how collaborative this art really is at its core, even though sometimes the collaboration has kind of been like an assembly line, but when it happens at the same time, I fucking love it. So um, that's my answer there. Let's see, that's five of the seven questions I'm looking at right now. Rel Williams underscore Film Life. What qualities should a director look for in building a team? I'm not totally sure of the question. I, I imagine that's department heads. I'm going to assume like your production designer, your DP, your editor, your script supervisor, your AD, your costume designer. Like I think fundamentally you're looking for people who understand the story that you're trying to tell, who have, you know, in a perfect world, they have the resume to to match. But I think you could have a great resume and not understand the story and not have a passion for what you're trying to do and not have a connection to the themes. I'd rather work with somebody who's emerging, but has those things than someone who's got a great resume and it's just another job. The other thing is, how do you collaborate? I, it, I, there's kind of a, a no asshole policy for me because it's we're spending way too much time around each other um, to be dealing with that day in and day out. So if I have an ability to have an impact on that, the no asshole policy is in effect. And also too, like when when I sat down and wanted to become a director, you know, back in 1993, like I, I did that because it was fun and it was something that really engaged me and excited me. And I do not uh, look to have my team sour that experience for me. So that is that. Is that. I've got two more questions, one from Serena Dykeman, a uh, former student of mine at NYU, and one from Lozano Pipo, who, if I'm not mistaken, was helpful in our wedding in Mexico at the Fairmont, Mayacoba. And I will get to y'all's two questions next week because at 17 minutes in on this intro, it's time to get to Mr. Jonathan Judge. So without further ado, y'all, let's get into Mr. Jonathan Judge for episode 57 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Roll sound. Speed. The interview. Take one. So one of the amazing stats from your long resume is that you have a pilot to series ratio of 17 to 19, which I've been told is unequaled in television. So, um, And were you told that by my manager by any chance? I was told that by your manager and, I, uh, and we share the same manager, Stephen Marks, yep. who is great. Um, He's awesome. But how, does, uh, how, yeah. how do you do that? What's the secret sauce? That's a, that's a really good question. Like in the number is all the like I keep forgetting the number and Steven's like adamant that it's 17 out of 19. I feel like it's 15 out of 18. But he's like, there's one that doesn't count. I forget. But um, <laughs> I've been very lucky to get involved in projects early as a as a director. And now lately as a director, executive producer, which gives you gives you even a little more input. You know, I would say the secret was one I got good projects, right? Obviously, because mm -hmm. no one can predict, you know, if a show is going to make it or not. But but the other is just going into a pilot. I come from the indie film world. That's where I started yeah. back in the 90s. So like when you started a project, you thought about it globally. You thought about 360 of it. And you weren't just going in there to say, hey, I'm directing this, you know. And when you do a pilot, you really you got to think like the showrunners, you got to think like the network. But in the end, you just got to tell the story. I, I, I say I'm a storyteller. I, I write when I have to and I, I produce when I have to, but I'm really a right. director. But it all goes back to what's the best way to tell the story. And thinking about it from every position, thinking about the color, thinking about, you know, the costumes, thinking about the camera work, what is going to be different with each project. And a couple of projects I was up for, other friends, directors were up for it too. And they, you know, they say, they, they asked me questions about color and they asked me questions about music and about tone. And right. when you're a pilot director, that's a big part of what you do. Whereas as a gun for hire too, as you know, you don't 
get asked that as much. You know, you're right. coming into a ship that's already sailing and you're, you're, you know, just fitting in and adding your touch to it. So from a pilot, you got to build it from the bottom up. And I love that. Fortunately, I love that. I love music. I love finding obscure camera references and going, what if we do this? What if this scene looks like that? And hopefully you're gelling with the showrunner who's like, ooh, that's taking what yeah. I was thinking and elevating it. So I don't know yeah, I if think, that answers I think your question or not. But No, it definitely does. I think it touches on a little bit of a, of a secret sauce that maybe other directors could oh. consider adding to their ingredients because, you know, like when I, when I have a meeting for an episodic job, like I, I literally, I treat it like a pilot, you know, I go and I say, all right, what are they doing with lighting? What are they doing with music? What are they doing with editing, with the camera, with performance? Because, you know, they're, they're, these are all the things that you can find how you fit into the show. But then there's also this thing where some of the things that become the DNA of the show aren't as aren't as designed as they might, as we might think, right? Yeah. It's like, they, like they, they're they doing this stuff with camera and it just kind of ended up being that. And maybe you have a take on it that returns them to how they originally wanted to, to, to consider it, but they just went off the mark. So it's kind of like, it's great to work that muscle. I, I agree 100%. Like on a series, when you come in, it, and, and as you know, it's, is it the, I always, for a while, I was getting the third episode of season one. <laughs> uh -huh. So, because I wasn't a pilot director yet, if whatever that is, you know. And so, pilot director would come in and then move on, and they'd be like, Whoa, we got some things, you know, we're on the air, but it's not. And I'd come in and basically do what I would have done in the pilot, but kind of write the ship a little bit and, and find those things. And, right. I, I'd like you said, I love it. And I'm also surprised a lot at, and I work with a lot of great writers who, when they write something, they don't necessarily visually have an idea for what that is. Yeah. Some do, obviously. Some are like, I want it to look like this. I want it to be, you know, shallow focus. I want it to have an energy. Others are like, right. what do you want to do? And that is the best canvas because you yeah. get to go, well, this is how, when, when I read your words, this is what my head pictured. Right. Let me show you how I would do that. And hopefully you click and it goes forward. And I've been really lucky to do that and and connect over the years and and then those shows have hit and and gone on so that's i think what the luckiest thing is yeah you know? that's a great skill too man like i i was my wife and i were reading a script not at the same time <laughs> not sharing the script but we were <laughs> page, uh, by page. <laughs> page by page but we were reading it and and talking about it and we were like you know it was interesting because it was it's a really good idea but on the page, it's not being enhanced. It's the kind of thing, like, as you talk about what the script's about, you're like, oh man, actually, this is really good. But it just, on the page, it didn't have the thing that make it read, that, that makes it read well. And, you know, that's a, ah, that's a, that's a pitfall. You know, it's great when you can come in and, 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 and kind of take some of the visual reins, but sometimes like, you know, a good idea can remain hidden underneath all the extra clothing of, 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 of bad writing. For, for sure. And, and, and I think that too, and you're, you're a writer too. I saw like, I, I, I write how I would direct. Like when I do write, it's very much like how I'm going to direct, which I think is very clear. Cause we have to be very clear when we're on set, right? We're, we're not right. asked back if we're like mumbling or unclear about our vision. So I write that way. And I've always surprised at good ideas that like, like you said, the clothing is just overwhelming it and it's getting lost. And yeah. And then there's ones that are bare bones. I love that where someone gives you a bare bones script, but it's all there. Like every mm -hmm. element is there and you go, oh, I see where I can go with this. Those are the most exciting. And, and hopefully you're working with a, a writer who goes, yes, please, you know, yeah. like take it and make it better. Not that it wasn't right. there, but just elevate it. Right. So, so before, before the, whether it's 15 out of 18 or 17 out of 19, before, before <laughs> that, you know, where'd you grow up and how, how'd you find your way into appreciating the power of stories? Um, oh, I was like an avid reader when I was little. I grew up in Long Island, New York. I'm the youngest of seven kids, hmm. crazy Irish family. And I was just a, uh, a reader, you know, I, my parents would have to 
punish me like during the summer and say, hey, you can't read. You got to go to bed. You know, that was kind of a, uh, you know, a penalty. But I also had a dad who loved movies and mm -hmm. every Friday we'd go to movies. And as the youngest of seven, I was seeing many movies that I should not have seen. At, <laughs> at like what? Uh, well, the one that was probably most scarring, I think it was five or six where I saw The Changeling with George C. Scott, which is this uh -huh. terrifying horror movie. But my first movie experience was a free screening at a, at a library, a double feature of Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet and Harold and Maude. Wow. I, I was four years old. And, right. and when I think back on that, I look at like my sensibility and it's very romantic. And, uh -huh. and uh -huh. it's also very black comedy. And, and I think that that was implanted very early. But I never, I was writing a lot. I went to school in Ohio for journalism. I was writing for stringing for the New York Times. I, w I thought I was going to, people would say, you're going to go into advertising. I didn't know what that meant, but I was like, okay, I'll write for advertising. Commercials are fun. And I was doing videos with my friends in class. You know, instead mm -hmm. of doing a paper, I'd do a video. Um, and I, I tell this story because it literally is the only time this happened to me. I was at a movie in Dayton, Ohio with my girlfriend. And the movie finished. It was Peter Pan's Hook by uh -huh. Spielberg, which I don't love as a movie. I wouldn't say that as a movie. But like at the end of it, I said, it'd be fun to make movies. And my girlfriend uh -huh. at the time said, you should. You'd be great at it. And the ceiling opened up. Uh -huh. ah, the light shone down. And that was junior year. I was looking for internships. I immediately... And and most viewers under 40 won't get this. I like got the yellow pages and started looking for film schools and calling up colleges and going, do you have a film program? I went to the new school, did a short film that summer, mm -hmm. applied to so, like so five you were films. So you were in Ohio and then you you found the new school in the yellow pages I, and went to yeah, New York? I, 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 what are film schools in New York? And there was the new school, Parsons. They had a summer mm -hmm. program. It was expensive, you know, but... I, I took two courses there that summer, made a mediocre short film and applied to film schools thinking there's no way in hell I'm going to get into any of them. You know, UCLA, USC, NYU, North Carolina and and got into NYU on the strength of my writing, I think, because they that you had to submit a writing sample. And, and I had a lot of writing behind me. And right. so I, I did a year at NYU, loved it and then pulled a tag off a wall which most people don't get either, you know, where it said a phone number and here's an internship. Right. And went to an indie film company and, and got an internship, not knowing that the person who hired me was about to leave and thought, oh, this guy can take over this no budget feature that I don't want to do. And suddenly I was I was <laughs> line producing a forty thousand dollar feature in New York and they oh, asked boy. me to do another one. And I took a year's leave of absence from NYU thinking, hey, I can go back and then then realized, at least for me, while I loved everybody I was with at NYU and I loved that program, that I didn't have to pay at that time thirty thousand a year right. to learn what I was learning on others other people's dimes, you know. Right. So I did who, that. I did a lot of that. Who were some of your counterparts there at the time at NYU? Okay, I was thinking about this as I was falling last night, sleep last night. It's funny. We're sitting there in the first day in the production class, and they're doing the roll call, just like old fashioned, name by name. Yeah. And they go, Morgan Freeman. And everybody turns <laughs> and looks. And there's this white dude with curly black hair from Santa Cruz, Morgan J. Freeman, who like two years later won Hurricane Street. Hurricane Street's won three awards at Sundance, you know? Right, right. And I'm like, okay. They go through the line a little bit longer and they go, Steve McQueen. And we oh, turn wow. and there's a British black dude. And it's right. Steve McQueen, who obviously went on and killed it in so many things at 12 he's years. He's doing OK. Sleeping. He's doing OK. He, he's doing all right. And, and so that was like the first day. But there was John Hamburg was in my class. John is yeah. an incredible writer, but director. Along came Polly. And oh, oh, Malcolm Lee. Malcolm huh. Lee was in my class. And he and I were in an acting class together where we had to play the two brothers in Italian Brothers in a Spike Lee film, I remember. So there was a. And, and a bunch of other people who've gone on and and done a lot of television and writing work. So it was this incredible group of like 50 people who were very creative. And uh, I was 23. I was one of the youngest because I got in right out of film school. And there were like 45-year-old people there. And I remember yeah. when I was making my films that 
I was good at making films, but I didn't feel like I had anything to say. And these right. people had things to say, like they had visions already where I was technically right. very good, but uh, well, I still even, had a... It's interesting though, right? Because I, I wonder how much, because I, you know, I used to, I went to NYU undergrad and then I worked in the production office where grad and undergrad would come and get their forms and okay. learn how to file for insurance and all that. And the the takeaway that I saw between grad and undergrad, I guess, was twofold. One was definitely they, they were older, so they probably were more, had a little more clarity about what they wanted to do versus like, you know, the joke for undergrad would be like day one, who wants to be a director? And every single hand goes up. And then, yep. you know, as you go and do that sophomore, junior and senior year, you end up with like, you know, one fifteenth of the student body it still right. wants to do it, so they know what they want to do. But then also, they just have the, they just have the, you know, the heartache and the and the miles on their lives Life that, yeah, yeah, that make you want to, you know, have have a perspective. But that, but can they tell the story yet? You know, not necessarily. But I guess that speaks to the fact that, like, as a emerging storyteller. And how quick can you find what you want to say? Like if you like, that's to me the point of making shit over and over and over again. Like if you can find out what you want to say by 25 versus 30, you know, God like bless you. well, you're was, off to the races. That was Morgan Freeman, right? He, yeah. he had a film that hit and had heart and, and, and really resonated. And he's done a couple of films since then. And then, then he created 16 and Pregnant, but <laughs> on MTV. There was another guy in my program, Brett Morgan. Now, Brett did The Kid Stays in the Pictures yeah. documentary. And he and did is the, that him David and uh, Nanette Burstein work together? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and Brett, at that point, had three documentaries that were on television already and in festivals uh -huh. when he joined the grad program. Right. And and he wanted to, he knew what he wanted to do, be a documentary filmmaker, but he wanted to, that was his choice to go to school to do that. Yeah. I'm not sure if he stayed in all three years or not, but he was... He was making great films already when he was in the grad program. I, I, I'm a, I love comedy. I'm drawing the comedy. So I had a script that I did in NYU that everybody loved and I developed into a feature. And that was what I was trying to do from like 95 to 98, 99 is get this like $1 million feature off the ground. It was about an Irish, a crazy Irish family in Brooklyn, you know? So right. it took me a little while to find that to say I didn't have that. Uh, you know, straight out of the box. I didn't have that burning story because as you know, making a film, especially back then, making an indie film on 16 millimeter that you like, that is all consuming. And I was like, what do I really want to do and say? And I didn't have that for a while. So, right. What do you, what would be your takeaway as far as the, the value or not of formal film education? I, it's a really good question. And I should preface this with, after I left film school, I started teaching at some of the film schools. Like I taught a course, beg, borrow, or steal at Film Video Arts, because I was helping these no budget filmmakers get films made. And I was like, yeah. well, why don't I go pick up 150 a month or whatever, you know, teaching. Right. I also over created at, a Over film. at 817 Broadway, wasn't that where? Yes, I, yes. I remember, you man, see, we, Second we were floor. in the, yeah, we we were we obviously were at a coffee shop or passing each other or were, you know, were you when you were working at NYU, was it Christine Choi who was the, the chair of? Yeah, yep. it was her. And then later, John Tintori after her. Yep. All yeah. right. And Yuri Dinsenko, like I, I know we know all the same professors and people uh -huh. there. So we, we probably crossed paths a few years when I was 97. I created a film school called The Real School. It was R-E-E-L school. And mm -hmm. my friend Ann Shisan and I, I was working with, I was freelancing then. So I location manage a Steve Buscemi music video. And I knew these filmmakers and I knew these younger filmmakers who wanted me to like line produce their films. And I created a school for filmmakers by filmmakers. So like my first class was Be Gentle, It's My First Time. And over <laughs> nine weeks, each week was a different first time director. So right. it was Maria Magenti, John Hamburg. Oh God, I'm blanking on, on Dan's last name, but I created a course that I wanted to know. Like I wanted to know from these filmmakers, how did you get your script written? How did you get financing? How did you work with actors? 
So I did that from like 97, 2000. We never designed it to make money, but it it got pretty popular. We had a festival class where Sundance, Cannes, South by Southwest, they all came, the programmers of that festival came and sat with 10 filmmakers and talked. We did a directing actors for film class with Tom DeCillo, with Tom Noonan, Steve Buscemi, like I, so I was in this indie film scene and, and just sitting there and creating classes that I wanted and moderating those. Right. So I, I have, the, the, the short answer to your question is, I think putting yourself in a program that enriches you is really important. I left NYU not because I didn't like it. It's because I, w- I was very practical and I was like, well, I, got, I don't have this money. You know, right. and I'd rather go out and work. And I promised myself as long as I was still directing, I wouldn't mm-hmm. go back to school because I think the grad program created a bubble mm. of you're a director. You right. can put off your loans, but you're a director. People talk to you like you're a director. They ask you what films you're working on. Right. And you're in the mindset of I'm a director. The minute you go outside of film school and you get into the industry, no one's interested yeah. if you're a director or not. You're just Jonathan. Can you location, man. Can you, can you dolly <laughs> grip for me on Saturday? Can you right. sound mix this? And you got to fight, you know, to to do that. So that was what was important to me. But I I, I don't know. I still teach. I t- went back to Dayton and taught in North Carolina School of the Arts. And I, I, I think it's very valuable. And what's valuable about it is the filmmakers who you will get to teach and getting yeah. people who are actually out there working in the industry, which is very hard because they're working in the industry, I think is important. So if you're looking at a program, you got to look at that, you know, who are yeah. the teachers? I think you hit the nail on the head and, 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 you know, you know, I wrote my book for the same reason. It's like, what would I love to read? And then also like, even when I taught, I would have like, all right, here's what the syllabus tells me to do. <laughs> right. You know, on Fridays, though, for the last 90 minutes, y'all can ask whatever you want. And right. I'm going to tell you the real shit, you know, yeah. even if it doesn't click for another five years, you will have heard it. So when do you when do you get your when do you set your sights on television? Because at, at the time we're talking about now, TV for an independent filmmaker was like Australia. Right. Yeah. Like how do you how do you get there? So how did that evolution happen and, and what drew, what drove it? You're taking me back. It, it's, I realized I was interviewed like four years ago or something. And I realized that my career started as a joke and I will tell you why. So I had this script, I had this script that everybody liked, but I hadn't directed anything, but a couple student short films and they weren't that good to be honest. And it was at that time. And you probably remember it where if you had a really strong short film and a script, you could kind of get a million dollar deal. You you weren't getting handed, you know, a superhero movie, but you were like, hey, let's make this film because you had a short. So some investors said, well, we'd like to see what else he can do. And I love jokes. Like, I love jokes. And I think jokes are perfect, honed over time, like weathered (laughs) over time, like urban legends to be perfect little short films. So I took six, and I'm also very practical. So I was at this production company, that same place, like I went as an intern, had my tie on. I was with them. They're the first people who were like, we like your script. Let's make it. And I was producing other things for them, shorts for other filmmakers and and line producing. We're talking like 400,000 to maybe a million, million five budgets back then. And I said, well, let's make six short films all based on jokes with six different styles. That'll show a range. And it'll also, we can sell them to Comedy Central maybe, you know? So we took $6,000, shot on film, pulled in all these favors, shot six short films, got them out there in festivals. It didn't help me raise the money for the movie, but it HBO called. Somehow they got to HBO in the promo department right after Sopranos had just hit. So they had right. original programming. And this head of promos wanted to do original programming within the promo department. He's like, these are perfect. So I was hired to direct 24 short films for HBO that all start like Sopranos would end or Oz would end. Right. Fade up and it would be uh, the title like, so this guy's in prison. And then you jump in and it would be a prison. It, it would look like a prison drama, but in the end there would be a joke and then it would say an actual joke told by HBO. Huh. That was my big break. 
but did 24 of those, which got me into like, I also did some urban legend short films for Doug Lyman's company because the internet was starting then and like, oh, right. we can put short films on the internet. Wow. And Aaron Kaplan, uh, William Morris at the time, now Aaron Kaplan's major wow. TV producer, he was a lit agent at William Morris. He saw an Amish short film I did, an Amish family goes to the mall, called me up. I was trying to get an agent and no one was answering me, William Morris, and then Aaron called up and said, I saw your short film. I can sell this to the WB as a TV series in five minutes. We want to represent you. Like, wow. not joking. That it, When people ask, how'd you get an agent? I was like, do everything possible and then have something random, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about television. I wasn't thinking about an Amish sitcom for sure. But Aaron has a very famous, like, how to pitch sheet that's out there. If you Google it, like, he, and he kind of taught me and my partner at the time had a pitch. We developed an Amish sitcom. We went out. Everybody said, this is a great pitch. No way in hell we're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and then my backup pitch, you know, you always bring was based on my short, fi my feature film, which was about a crazy Irish family and gave that pitch that and Fox and CBS ended up buying it for us to write it. It didn't get picked up that year, but suddenly I was in the once a year pitching sitcoms world. Right. And then at the same time, I took my reel and I said, who in New York do I know that has a television series? And the first only episodic I knew of was Blue's Clues. Uh -huh. So my first episodic was Blue's Clues. I wasn't into kids TV. I, I love kids TV, but I knew a coordinator on a feature who was now producing Blue's Clues. I gave him my reel. I got a chance in there and that started me in episodic television and kids TV. And then since from there, it's, as you know, it's been a, you know, crazy wild journey. So what were, what were some of the first things I'm assuming that you hadn't worked with kids exclusively up until that point, right? So what were right. some of the first things that you began to learn in dealing with these productions that were populated by children? I, the, it, what's funny is I've gotten a lot of jobs and, and some of the network jobs I've gotten is because we have kids and people uh -huh. act like kids are like wild animals, you know, or like you're working with vipers or snakes. <laughs> that never was an issue for me. One of my first short films had a couple of kids in them because my screenplay had some kids. So I wanted to show, hey, look, he is a facility with, you know, getting great performances out of kids. Right. I, I don't work with them differently than I work with adult actors. I, I, I kind of yeah. treat them as adults. I mean, you don't, I don't yell at actors to begin with. I, I've been told I'm like a, a firm coach, you know, like uh -huh. I'm on a show uh -huh. now where we've been doing it for two movies and 27 episodes of the series. So I'm like, come on, you know, we can do this. Like I'm reminding you of, you know, right. there's 13 kids on that show between three and 20. So it's, it's a handful. But I think the things I do as a director that I'm good at are not just for kids. Right. One is clarity. Mm -hmm. You know, the best thing I learned at NYU is what does an actor want? Direction. And what does that mean? Sometimes it's literally, you're going to walk in that door, you're going to go over to this table, and then I see you going over there. Right. And that might be all they need, some actors. Or other actors might want you to fill in all the way in between that. But it literally is direction of movement. You know, here's mm -hmm. what you're doing at this moment. And of course, where were you before you walked in that door and where are you going afterwards? Like those right. are the basics. And kids, you just need to focus that a little more. You're here, you're doing this. What are you thinking? And I've been fortunate to work with a ton, ton of kids and, and be with kids on their first gigs. Jenna Ortega, like I, yeah, I worked with her the night before she auditioned, like Disney asked me to come in and, hey, we like her, but we're not sure. And I had a session with her and she didn't need me. I'm not saying, you know, right, like she right. was awesome. But, you know, we worked on a session and then she got stuck in the middle, which I did the pilot for. And now, and it was obvious, like if you've worked with kids, like she was incredible at what she does. And now, obviously, everybody else is realizing that on a bigger scale. But I've been lucky to work with a lot of kids. And I, I take it as it's very important to me to not only get the performance out of them, but right. to teach them how to be a good actor um, right. and a good person. You know what I mean? Right. So like there's a bunch of that there's a more responsibility there than when you're working with an adult actor who's come in and should be 
a good person already, right? But mm. this kid is learning from everybody on that set. That's their school. How do I That's be a, a really big part of the job, right? Like I, I feel like I feel like if everyone embraced the fact that there's a mentor teacher aspect of of everyone's job, you know, we'd have we'd have a lot a better culture on most sets. And also we'd be ensuring the longevity of the industry and the craft because people need to know how to make the sausage, you know? Yeah. No, I agree. And and I think you teach, I, I teach, I think that I've been very lucky with, I asked everybody I met a question. I never asked for anything. I didn't say, will you make my film? But I would say, how did you get involved in this? This is, I swear to God, this is how I got into NYU. I, I, I show up at NYU in a Glenn Plaid suit and a, and a paisley tie, like overdressed. Uh-huh. Like, right, but that right. was where I was coming from, advertising, right? That's what you, I get on the elevator with Spike and Spike is, you know, dressed as Spike dresses. And I'm like, oh my God, I made a mistake. <laughs> right. I walk into the room. It's the chair at that time was the guy who produced Midnight Cowboy. There was the editor of Carrie. There was the guy who created the Tales from the Crip and another person. Mm. And we sit down, we joke, we talk. They joke about my suit. I sit back on this couch, <laughs> I remember, and I lean back into this couch that just swallows me. And then they go, so we saw your short film and we really didn't think it worked. And I remember going like swimming out of the couch, like, <laughs> like get on your chair and, and explaining. And I, I, I'm good at talking. So explaining what I wanted to achieve and how I achieved it and what I would do better. And 15 minutes, right? Watch, check. Okay, thank you very much. And I realize, you know, a thousand people applied, 50, 100 are interviewing, 50 are getting in. I'm not one of those, not at 15 right. minutes. And they said, do you have anything else? And this wasn't manipulative. This was genuine. And I do it all the time still. I was like, I would love to know how each of you got into the industry. Huh. 45 minutes after that, right. we're hearing stories about how Roy Hill went up to this producer and said, hey, it's a great Midnight Cowboy is a great movie, but I heard you didn't win the Oscar at the Oscars. And then they won the Oscar and he's never talked to him since. The editor of Carrie and, and they're all talking at the end of it. We're laughing. They're shaking my hand. And the chair was like, thank you so much. I've worked with these people for five years. I knew none of this. Huh. And I swear to God, that's why I got in the NYU. It yeah. wasn't my film for sure. My writing, I think, was pretty good. But it was because I created an environment by accident in that room of collaboration and learning and, and talking. And I went out with a good impression, you know. So you were, you were directing your interview, it, is, it appears. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea I was doing it at the time, but, you know, it taught me a lot. It, and, and I've been lucky. Everyone I ask, I find people in this industry, you're finding it, obviously, on these podcast people like to talk about their journey because every journey is yeah. different yeah. and it's it's not narcissism it's kind of sharing your journey but it's also learning from other people and I, I agree with you that on sets that is the perfect place to learn and sometimes there's so much pressure on it but that people don't want to share that or feel defensive like I don't want to show you what I do because then I might be out of a job and it just right. that doesn't work for me you know right right yeah, there's no fear of uh, someone taking your spot if 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 you are if being yourself is is threaded to how you do your work. You know, like you you and you 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 alone are unique, so it's like you don't have to really worry about other people taking your director slots or taking your DP position or taking your right. gaffer position. I, I I honestly I'm with you on that page. So as, as, as we're continuing now, so that's around 03, 04 with Blue's Clues. Um, no, that's, ni- that's scary. That's 97, 98. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah. IMDB, man, they, they be lying sometimes. Oh, no, you know what? You, you're, oh, wait. Well, I was still, it went on for seven years. You're right. So mm-hmm. that show was on forever. And then it became Blue, Blue's Room, which was Blue's a puppet Room. show. And I was doing uh-huh. that. The scary thing was I was asked to reboot, help reboot Blue's Clues five years ago. And if uh-huh. you want to feel old, it's to go back and reboot the show that you did, your first show you did 20 years later. And it was surreal because that was a show that was 
one guy who's a good friend of mine in a green room mm -hmm. and a couple computers because it's a very technical show and one camera. And there we were. We went from New York to Canada and we're all the same people 20 years later <laughs> in this green room doing basically the same show that we amped up a little bit, but the show worked. That was surreal. Yeah, but but a testament to to something that worked. Yeah, and worked you really know? really well. That that affected a lot of kids' life. And it, and it, in terms of my career, what was really interesting then, and you'll probably remember this back then, no one had done green screen, and it was like, how do you do green screen? So the fact that I right. done a show that was very doesn't look very technical, but was all on green screen, mixed with animation got me commercial work and promo work because, oh, you, you know, green screen, you know? So right. now everybody knows green screen. It's easy, you know, but that started me on a path that I never thought of, which was one kids and preschool specifically was it's its own little genre, but animation, the hybrid technology got me experienced in that and, and interested in that. And that has continued. That thread has definitely continued to, you know, I'm, I'm doing projects now that are mixed animation hybrid in Unreal in real time. And right. so you can directly trace that back, not a straight path, but a zigzaggy path back to, you know, my first gig. So talk to me about this, about Lazy Town and what was technically going on in that project. And that, that's 2005 to 2007. So again, yep. a little bit ahead of the curve on the bleeding edge of, of this technology. So I didn't know it at the time. I was I was asked to produce Lazy Town. I saw this trailer on VHS and it was shot on film and it just looked amazing. It looked like an action movie, but it was a preschool show. And the creator of it was from Iceland. He's kind of the Jack Lalene, Arnold Schwarzenegger of Iceland, <laughs> uh, you know, a fitness guru. And he wanted to do this show. So we... Um, I got the trailer. My friend was involved with it. They wanted me to produce, and I knew it was just a horror show to produce. It was live comp. It was shooting on the Viper. It was the largest HD production in the world at that time, you know, because mm -hmm. it was shooting so much. And I just kept pushing to direct on it. And they went through like seven directors, and they shot in Iceland. And I finally got a call to come out and test with the creator other director. And I got there and a day after I was there, they were like, you're staying here. So I lived in Iceland for a year over two years. But technologically, I didn't even know what we were doing because it was so well set up. It was an Unreal Engine. So the very basics that are in Mandalorian were there. Mm -hmm. We were shooting with puppets that were realistic looking puppets, prosthetic makeup, Jackie Chan stunt people, all live comping the show. So we'd build set pieces, again, just like the Mandalorian, and then everything else behind like the walls that we used to cut off the, the horizon line was live comped in there. And so I knew, I didn't know it was unreal at the time. I knew it was technology and I knew enough of the technology. And of course I would go downstairs with the animators and the editors. And, but we, I would pick a camera angle. We would do some calculations on the floor then because they actually had to do math, enter that right. math problem into a computer and the game engine, boom, you were in that world. So if you pan the camera, the background pan. So it's it. almost like you're, you're like on an X, Y, Z axis. Exactly. In China. I, okay. So, so that's, it, those were the calculations they would have. And, and there was a cement floor and they would unchalk, figure uh -huh. out the calculations on the floor. And then the grip would hand the grip in Iceland. Everybody has like 87 jobs. They're so good at right. things, but the grip would also be like, this is the calculation the unreal guy next to me would enter it in. I'd say, you know what, move that building over because that doesn't compositionally look great and move that, right. do that live. They'd move right. the world live for you, lock it in, and then you would just shoot and you would have it comped then and there. I have I have some, on my, I'm not sure if it's on my website, but if you want, I can send you, I have some behind the scenes of like how we're doing it and how it was oh, live. Yeah, that'd be and cool. It, it was way ahead of its time and I've only appreciated it now 20 years later where I'm doing some a lot of stuff in Unreal and working with Epic and they're going lazy town and they knew about it like Epic huh. was involved with it early on right they want their technology to be film which it's becoming on many right. places you know 
And just for the, to make sure folks understand, can you just kind of break down this Unreal Engine for the, for the five-year-old that's somehow watching or listening this podcast? And then the also, <laughs> what's the distinction, if any, between that and the volume? Okay. First of all, the five-year-old probably gets it way better than us because they're using it every day. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and I always say this, like I am, and I and Epic has had me speak a couple of times because I will talk about a project I did that still hasn't been done that way. And I, I was brought into that project. I did not, you know, create the technology for that project, but I call myself a caveman director. <laughs> so my knowledge is the simple caveman director, you know, using his tools. So... Unreal Engine is a gaming engine that Fortnite, most of the big games that are interactive games where you can run around a world and turn left, turn right, look up, look down, go behind right. a house, in a house. That Most of those, not all of them, there are other programs are created in Unreal. So it's basically a gaming engine. So for Lazy Town, we created the game, which was the world. Right. And then the camera became a character. So you could move around that world and look around that world. And the trick with Lazy Town was linking that to the camera to actors so that they felt like they were real people in a very animated, that Lazy Town was very stylized. So we weren't trying to make it not look like animation in the background. You know, it was a very surreal show. The uh, the way Unreal is used today, it's it's used a lot in previs, but like on Mandalorian, they have taken Unreal and created their system where they're doing the same thing, but photorealistic. So the mm -hmm. desert of Tatooine is there and it looks real and they've created that and that's on LED screens. We were doing it with green screen, which you can do, but they their world is a wall of screens that each one of those screens is making that world look real. And so when they're shooting... They're shooting the actor with wind on their face and the dust blowing behind them. And mm -hmm. it's all composited there in camera with tweaking in post, obviously. Right. But And are they still inputting the same kind of X, Y, Z coordinates? Because I, I went to a, a, a presentation and it really, it kind of, the thing that blew, two things blew my mind, but the thing that blew my mind first was like watching the screens adjust as the camera tilted up. And, mm -hmm. was, and was making, it was almost like power windows for, you know, in post-production where you're kind of identifying an, a yep. particular area. But to watch that happen in real time was like bananas. It is very mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing 20 years ago when you would pan the camera and see the animated world. And now as you go to these these different displays of what they're doing, it it is. It's taking that math, it's, it's refined, and it keeps leaping forward. Because one thing Epic mm -hmm. does the gaming community, you're allowed to hack their software and give it back to them. That's the culture. And then uh, Epic decides, yeah. oh, you figured out, like we had a big problem in the project I did getting to 2399 frame rate because gaming isn't in that rate. And right. it's a problem that, so like, how do we slate and how do we sync and how do we do that? And there was a hack that our computer genius came up with that gave to Epic. And I think they've ended up using it and giving it out there so everybody can use it. I, I right. love that part of the, kind of the the gaming um, unreal culture. It's everybody's trying to make it as good as possible. Um, right. I want to answer the volume question because the volume, as I understand it, is, I don't know if it's only in unreal. I don't think so. I think it's the area of which you can shoot that everything is mapped when you're in there. Okay. So um, I did I did this project called Voxels and I can definitely show you. Uh, the test footage of it. We created a volume which was 40 by 60 feet. All the motion capture sensors, and there's various ones for that. There's some in the ceiling, there's some that are cameras, there's some that are marks, uh, covered anything in that volume. They were tracking it. Mm -hmm. So if you were in a motion capture suit and stepped into that volume, you were being recorded. And if you were a prop that they put motion sensors on, it would be recorded. So I did what I still believe I've been told is the first and only live animated real-time sitcom. Hmm. What, that doesn't wow. seem to make sense. But what it is, is the actors with face cams and with motion capture suits, the sets and the props, we would put like a, you know, what's a good door is a C-stand 
with the mocap on it because the uh -huh. actor grabs it and does it. And that is tracked to a door. So when they right. do that, a door opens up live right there. Right. We shot that where the actors created, I think in the end, about 75% of the animation with their bodies and their faces. Huh. And it was that's so real wild. time. That yeah. was, that's, that's the second thing that impressed me at the presentation I went to in, in Manhattan Beach. They had, they were using assets from one of the many Star Wars shows. And there were two stormtroopers in like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say the deep background. These terms aren't necessarily accurate, but in the deep background of the image that was being presented, okay, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, they toggled some switch and it, the the background went away in that little area. And those two guys were in suits in San Francisco being tracked and, and being linked in to the to the to the volume yeah. and and presenting as the stormtroopers that we were seeing and i was like mind fucking blown that that's crazy yeah how hard is it just on set like if you had to set that shot up on set practically you know how hard it is to get the ad to get the two stormtroopers in the right position right. and the camera and that, 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 that. and they're doing it from another state <laughs> right virtually in a world it's i a couple times, and I was also able to put on a VR helmet and see the actors as they're animated yeah. portions, which was so trippy because you'd be staring into a wall, but you would walk around and be talking to them and see them. <laughs> I would have my brain flipped more than once. And the other thing that was really interesting, they, they, put up, they put up what they call reference cameras on the project I was on. And one was uh -huh. just a big old fisheye wide. I was like, why do we need that? Why can't I use that as another camera to get a close up during the scene? And they're like, well, that's the, how we find things. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we lose things sometimes. And huh. there's so much information going through those computers. All of a sudden you would see like an, the animated character like oh, and disappear. Right, 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 right. And right. you're like, we've lost them. And I was like, what do you mean we lost them? And they're like, we have to find them. So they'd, use, they'd go back to the footage, use the camera and go, okay, he was there. And then they would like search through the metadata and find that character and bring them back and it was wow. just like constantly getting your mind blown every step of the way wow that's awesome man and 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 such a distinguisher for your craft i'm sure as as new shows come along that are looking for experienced people with the technology hi this is princess monique films director of blackish greenleaf goldbergs and more and you're watching Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is Pete Chapman's book from Michael Weezy Productions. The reviews are in. Greg Berlanti says, there's a reason why everyone who works with Pete falls in love with his work. The lessons he imparts here are invaluable. Do yourself a favor and read it cover to cover. From Sarah Gamble, Pete's sharing gold nuggets that will spare you a ton of wasted time and help you channel your drive, talent, and ambition in the most productive way. And from Jesse Williams, this business has everything to do with preparation and expectations. Transitions grounds lessons in reality while empowering our artistry to run free. Not an easy balance to execute. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is available on Amazon and anywhere else you get your books. Don't forget about your mom and pop shops, people. So you started transitioning to, I guess, I mean, how would you describe a show like Tosh.0? And then, and then also I was going to comment on the, the Kids' Choice Awards, you know, as a producer on that. Like what brought you back to, to that type of, of content? It, it was all very organic. Like I want to work. Directors want to direct, right? And mm -hmm. that's and produce. So Tosh.0 was interesting because I had gone and done Lazy Town with that technology. And I had a general meeting and everybody in the industry knows what that is. But for those who are listening who don't, that's a meeting where Stephen Marks, my manager, set me up with Zoe Friedman at Comedy Central and a couple of people I'd never met. It's a general. You're going to go in, you know, they'll hopefully have looked at your reel. You'll talk about what you do, talk about things they're looking for, and you go away. And 99.9% .9 of the time, nothing comes from that. So I went into that meeting, and I always bring visual aids, and I was showing 
Lazy Town. I was showing what I'll send you where you're like, here's what we were doing. Right. And they were like, this is amazing because we're doing this thing called Tosh.0. Oh. They had done it as a play. They, they, at that point, Comedy Central would do theater things because it would cost less. They would bring a bunch of people into the theater and Tosh did his thing. And they had a little right. monitor that showed the videos. Right. And they're like, we want to take it to the next level. We want it to look like it's in an iPad. Okay, so this is what, 2006, seven, and maybe eight, the beginning of Tosh.0. So they wanted to be slick. They wanted Tosh to grab and move things. And, you know, like he was in a Mac. And they saw that I had done it. I leave there, get a call from Tosh and the producer the next day going, hey, they want us to meet with you. And I got the gig. So for me, that was big because I had been living in the kids world. You know, right. I'd been doing some stuff for HBO as, as promos and shorts, but I hadn't. There was nothing that would say you should be directing this edgy, you know, Comedy Central show. And I went in and we did it and we did the pilot. And that was amazing because I was there for the first, you know, web redemption where we figured out what that was. And I got to see Tosh and, and his producer's process. Like we interviewed right. the Afro Ninja. I don't know if you remember him from the internet, <laughs> the guy who was auditioning for the LeBron commercial and knocked himself out with the nunchucks. He got like 80 oh, million wow. hits on the web. <laughs> we found that guy, a stunt guy. And, you know, we figured out how to shoot a web redemption. So it was funny, but delivered that project. It looked amazing. There were like hundreds of screen behind him that was internet content and he'd bring it up and the note that we got from the network was it looked too good for their air huh which makes a lot of sense because comedy central stuff wasn't polished wasn't slick like the viewers right. were going in so they went back to a still slick version but a very simple it was talk soup you know he's got it he's in a fancy living room and he's got a yeah. just a screen there yeah but that's how I got that gig, which was great because it showed that, that I don't know if, if your viewers know, but directors get put into less so now as television has grown and film. But, oh, you're a kid's director. Oh, you're a comedy director. You're a half hour director. Like you've broken right. it. You're doing half hours and hour longs, you know, but it would be like, oh, he does drama. Oh, she does. She does murder mysteries. Like I got put into a kid's oh, you're a kid, a filmmaker. And people didn't right. really know what that was. The stuff I was doing was groundbreaking. Lazy Town was groundbreaking, but right. it looks like a, a very polished kid show. So that was helpful in that suddenly people were like, wow, he did Tosh.0. And then Tosh.0 became a giant hit. So that was a, a great credit that way. Yeah. The, um, the answer about the Kids' Choice Awards is, this is very funny, too. I was trying to get in their promo department to make money. I had done these promos for HBO. I had done episodic for Nickelodeon. I was like, hey, can I get some promo work? And someone said, we have this idea for a Saturday Night Live for kids where they pick everything. It was called You Pick Live. Huh. Still the most interactive thing I've ever done. And that was in 2002, 2004. The kids were voting on what shows they wanted to watch live. I was in a I produced it and directed. I would get the feed. I would pick the episode. I would send it to the control center. They would pick what challenges we did, what questions we would ask the guest, all while the show was going on. We were live every day, five to seven. And Pressure. I was told Saturday Night Live for Kids, and I just did whatever I wanted. And it was amazing. And it became this hit time period. We were getting like 11s and 14s back then, ratings-wise, right, which was right. insane. But I was working with all the Nick talent because they would come through this promotional vehicle. And so my hosts of my show were chosen to host like the pre-show of the Kids' Choice Awards. So there I was thrown into something I had never done before, a live pre-show where like I was responsible. Like if Will Smith was our final guest, like I had to cut him off at 7.59, oh, you know, because that show had to start right at 8 o'clock. And we right. did that for 10 years. And that wow. was a blast. You never knew what it was going to be. You didn't know what guests were going to show up. You just had to be prepared for everything. It's kind of just a, a metaphor for being a director, man. It's like it's such a unique playground that you had an opportunity to hone so many different skills. What was so? So you oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I feel very, I, I would say like when, and you've been through this too, you get an interview, right? Or a general, like, why are you a good director? And that's just such a hard, like, you don't ask an actor, why are you a good actor, right? Why? Right. 
Um, and you have to toot your horn a little bit. Luckily, we have managers and agents, right, who hopefully toot for us. But we got to be hustling all the time and, and selling yourself. The one thing I think I have is I have done and I'm constantly told this by crew members, which I appreciate. They're like, wait, you know, camera, you know, the technical, you know, the lighting, you know how to deal with the showrunners, you know how to deal with the network, you know how to mm -hmm. deal with talent. Everything I've done, I never set out like you asked how I got those jobs. They're totally random. But right. every single thing has given me a learning, another tool, you know, the caveman director, another tool right. that I put in my toolbox that I can use and whip out. And you never know when it's going to happen. You know, you never know when you're going to need, oh, I did live television. I know how to handle that right now. Right. I never set out for it. I don't know if I'll ever do it again, but I, I have that skill set now and I hold on to that. Right. And, and, and I always, the way I look at it is like the industry, I mean, look, we're, we're on strike right now. Yeah. Who knows what it looks like when we return? The more diversified your skill set and the mediums that you can work across, you know, the more likelihood you have the ability to, to keep working just on a, on a basic level. 100. 100. I was told early on that I, it might have been Aaron Kaplan. He's like, I don't know how to sell you because you do so many different things. Mm -hmm. And it, and back then, you know, late 90s, or early 2000s, they did want, oh, you're a sitcom, family sitcom guy. Right. Or you're this or that. And now I think that the world has realized, no, we need right. people who can do everything because a television episode is not the same as it was even 10 right. years ago. Like, can you do action? Can you do comedy? Can you do music? Can you do puppets? Like, Right. All those things make you more sellable. You know, I think that's the, the best byproduct of like the democratization <laughs> of media, which is, you know, from YouTube to Instagram, TikTok, Vine for a minute when it, when it was there. Yeah. It was like people were coming into the public consciousness by virtue of their multiple hat wearing. Yeah. And it just made it like you didn't have to be an independent filmmaker who wrote, direct, produced and acted and had like the breakout film of that year. You could be somebody who's trying to, you know, emerge and get on and say, I do all these things. And people were, would recognize that that's a fucking that's a that's a genre now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Someone who can do all those things. What was so what was the it seems like there was kind of unplanned kind of organic uh, evolution from, from, you know, st student filmmaker to, to kids TV, kids TV to the award show and the adult comedy. Like, did it work the same getting into the dramas for you? Or, or was that a very like specific strategic thing that you had to plot out? It wasn't, I, I would say I, I have goals and plans and I, I try for things, but it wasn't a strategic, but it was something that my, me and Steven worked on a lot, which he was getting me a lot of generals with people that I knew I wasn't going to get a meet, you know, a job out of it, but they were going to learn that I, you know, I did more than just the things that were on the resume at the time. Right. But what, what I've learned so far for me and everybody's different is at each point to get a break, you need to have a champion and you never know who that champion is going to be. But someone has to just like a director, we have to pick an actor. Someone has to say, we're going to give this person a chance. So the drama, which I I like telling stories, I don't care if it's a kid story or a murder story. I like using the camera to tell stories. A drama came from another like new technology thing. Albie Hecht was used to be the president of Nickelodeon, then had his own company then created a company where he was doing the first crowdsourced television show. And this was the guy, Will Wright, who created The Sims, you know, the Sim video game. Yeah. And he's I'm sorry, you just, you just threw me for a loop because I'm, I, I'll be hecked. I met when I was raising money for my film and I'm pretty, I'm pretty your documentary? sure. My, was it my, your... my feature, my, okay. my dramedy and, and he, he invested in the film. And I and we Another met connection. randomly exactly, and it was just like, oh wow, you're really gonna do that? Okay, <laughs> he's like, yeah. a champion. Yeah. He's a person. If he likes something, he is a person that goes, you're gonna do this, and yeah. and cuts through all the things. So, so 
Will Wright had created Sims. People were telling stories with Sims. And he's like, well, why don't I create a game that is make a television show? And right. so he created this storyboarding engine and beta testers from around the world would go in and they would write a little bit or do a storyboard and people would add to it. So in theory, the hive mind created a show. And as we know, like right. that's not always good. So Alby had to filter that. They did a mashup anyway. It was Bar Karma. It was about a bar that traveled through time and space. In each episode, someone like Quantum Leap came in the door from some existential moment in their life, and uh -huh. they came to this bar with a four thousand year old bartender, and they had to figure out what was wrong with their karma. Right. <laughs> so on my resume, right. nothing that says says that. Alby just knew me from Nickelodeon, from a, a show called The Naked Brothers Band that I did with him and Polly Draper, and he just knew I was good. And what I did, and I remember I got a call, I was in the park jogging one day, and he's like, I'm doing this project, you're going to direct it. That, mm. I have three of those maybe in my 25 years, right? I, I hope you have some, it's, it's rare, right? That someone just says, this is happening. Not right. come in an interview. And we were doing it for um, Current TV. It was their first uh, wow. I remember that. live action show. Yep, Al Gore's channel, yeah. right? Because it yeah. was a community. That's how it right. fit in. And so... It was insane, but suddenly I was doing a drama, working with these incredible New York theater actors. There was some comedy in it. I always put a little comedy, but there were also very dark moments. And it was sci-fi, and it was like, how do we use the camera and do camera tricks? And we did it for like 300,000 an episode. It looks great. Again, I can right. send you links, because you'll, you. and it's, but it was a thing where I was on, and I was like, I need a painting over the bed of the dead girl we're shooting on Wednesday. And right. a, a, a participant would say, here's a photo I took in Norway. Here's the release. Give it to the art department. They put it up. So they would wow. They would brainstorm on what script they wanted. A writer would take it. And in two weeks, a writer would write the script. And three weeks later, we would shoot. And two weeks after that, it was on the air. So mm -hmm. it was like a five-week turnaround. It was a great experiment. Some of them yeah. are really good. Some of them you know, are crowdsourced. There's a reason why there's not 400 directors or writers on a TV show, you know? Right. But, but that was, going back, that was Alby saying, hey, I want you to do this, and me loving it, and then now having something I could show to people that said, see, I do that too, you know? Right. And was that helpful in, in going now to Young Sheldon, The Cool Kids, Life in Pieces, you know, those it, one it, hours? It, it did. It did help. What was interesting, though, they weren't one hours. They were because we couldn't afford to do an hour on the budget. So they were like right. an hour show. And so the third act sucked on all of them. I will say that it would be like we'd raise this incredible existential dilemma and then we'd resolve it over the act break in the commercial and then right. it would be done. But it looked like an hour long. I mean, it looked like an FX show. And no one, as you know, sometimes watches episodes you send them. They watch reels and sizzles <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, do I've they do it. they even watch that? I always, I wonder what they're watching. I don't know. I appreciate the people say I haven't seen it. I had one guy who hired me. He's like, I didn't see your sizzle. Why would I? You're not going to show something bad in it. You're only going to show good stuff. So why would I even bother watching that? I'll give you an episode. And if you don't fuck it up, you'll do another one. I was like, yeah. I appreciate your honesty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, I've, um, I've been in this game a long time. I only have a certain amount of time each day before I go. Eat lunch. I don't have a minute 30 to watch all your favorite <laughs> shots cut into a montage. But it, it did help in that, like, again, my representation when I could get me into those meetings and say, look, and the people who wanted to take a chance could look and go, oh, wow, that's, you know, those are legit adult actors having a very emotional scene and it's really good. The break into network, and again, it's a champion. We were trying for a while and I would have meetings with great people who said, and especially people who had kids who knew the shows I was working on. Cause I got all the, I get all the high end kid shows. I got the, we want to do Ocean's 11, but with right. kids, you know, so I'm doing an Ocean's 11 movie, which is much harder on the budget and with kids who aren't necessarily the best actor and with eight and a half hours a day time with them. So it's even harder to pull that off. And some of those people who had seen those works with their kids appreciated it. Cause they were like, Oh, this is like a uh -huh, movie, uh -huh. but it just has a kid theme. So right. Stephen was really good finding those people who could appreciate that. And right. then I'll tell you what happened. I was trying to get in with a producer 
who did a Modern Family and my DP was on Modern Family. He's like, you should use this guy. He's really good. And it, it's, you know, it's a golden ticket. How do you break in there? But, right. and I was shadowing on 30 Rock because Al be hacked put me in touch with people at 30 Rock and was like, you should let him shadow you. So I was getting very close. Who did you shadow? Hard. I shadowed Beth and I shadowed Don. Okay. Don Scardino and Beth McCarthy. And Beth started like I started in MTV doing right. TRL. So we had very similar, like non-union, like figure out kind of yeah. way to do it. And, and they were great. And I got really close. And then Don left. Like Don had actually said, I think I'm going to suggest you because I think we need some new directors because they were very insular at 30 Rock. They, they liked the directors they had, understandably. They liked their process. And then he called me up and said, hey, I'm going to do a movie. And I was like, you know, my champion there right. had moved on. So, But I, I did a short film that was like a Wes Anderson, not a short film, a movie for Nickelodeon called A Hundred Things to Do Before High School. Great script by the showrunner I worked with a lot. And we were able to give it like a, a Wes Anderson film. I got nominated for a DGA award in children's programming. And I won. Lovely. And in my speech... I talked about Wes Anderson was nominated there that year for Budapest Grand Hotel. And I, I said we were trying to do Wes Anderson like what he does is really, really hard. Symmetry is really, really hard. And we call what we do Les Anderson. <laughs> so I got a laugh <laughs> right. at the DGA Awards, right? Two months later, my manager calls this producer who's doing Modern Family and doing Life in Pieces and says, hey, I, I really have been trying to get you to meet with Jonathan. And he was like, yeah, I saw him at the DGA Awards. He made that joke about the, I, I would love to meet with him. Right. Had a meeting with this guy I'd been trying to meet for two years. It was good. Walked out of there and got an episode. Again, a champion who said, yes, we're going to give this guy a chance. Went in, life in pieces, and it's 13 adult great actors, Diane Weiss, you know, so many great actors. And of course, I got the kids. They do three different stories, you know, over right. that period of time. I, they're like, you got the kids story because you know how to do kids. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> like, right, right, right. I don't want right. the kids story. I want the Diane Wee story. But I went in. I did it. I did it well. And Diane, the actors loved me. And I ended up getting called back in there. So now... Now I was proven with Fox, right? Yeah. So they were and like, you did okay. five episodes for, for that show, right? Yeah, and I would have done more. I, I was so, I loved that show and I loved that crew and that showrunner. And, and then they didn't get picked up for a fourth season for these various reasons. So, but that got me to, now Fox, I was a name. I was on the list. Like, right. oh, here's a director. So I was getting more opportunities. That got me into Cool Kids. Right. Which was the total opposite, right? Working with, 80 year old actors, you know, right. which was awesome. You know, they get tired faster than kids. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that was the only thing you, you had to realize, like, I can't have them standing during this take. You know, that's right. That, you got to think about that. But their their chops and comedy skill and Vicky, God, she was amazing. So I did that and that went well. And I got a, a bunch of episodes of that, but that didn't go forward. And then I got a chance to do a network pilot because one of the other things, I'm a single camera guy, but there was a period where all the kids' television was multicam, and I had right. to fight to get in there. And people were like, right. you're a single camera. You don't know how to do multicam. I was like, I can do multicam. And then I started getting the multicams that they wanted to not be multicams, the, act, the superhero show that they really wanted to be a superhero show. So I used four cameras, right. but shot it single camera style and made these like movies that were half hybrids, I would call them. And I got... Really good at that, but I started developing a way to do multicam where it didn't look as flat and as um, mm -hmm. traditional. And right. I got called in for by Peacock for the Punky Brewster pilot, and I got called in by um, Fox for a pilot, which ended up being, oh my God, the original outmatched it became. And, and the reason I think I got that one was because I, I could talk about how you can do a multicam in front of a live audience, which is what they wanted to do with Outmatched and, and Punky Brewster. But you can shoot it with a, a bunch of different ways. You can do it so it looks better and feels the viewers are more sophisticated now. You know, they mm -hmm. don't always want just a flat living room where people are profile inside. They wanted right. the show to look a little better. And do that within the confines of doing it in front of a live audience. And so, what are so you I, doing? Are you finding camera ports now, like more ports in the set to kind of have angles where the camera won't 
be in another camera shot? I, I can, okay, I, I'll t- tell you the three big things you do that change it. Yeah. One is sitcoms look flat because there's two giant boom mics on cranes that need to be able to swing around and get every line of dialogue, you know, no right. matter what. And so you can't have boom shadows. So knowing that, I went to the sound people. And I had done this on School of Rock because I wanted mm-hmm. School of Rock. The Paramount didn't want School of Rock to look like a sitcom, but they had budgeted Nickelodeon and budgeted it as a sitcom. So I built sets where you could pull off every wall. Right. And so sound, sound booms is an issue. Camera ports is important. Also just doing an A pass and then a quick B pass where you swing mm-hmm. the can like the X side, which is the right side, you go, you're out now. You're going to get a two shot down the middle. A, you're going up, which is the left side, and you're going to get up there and get better eyes and get an actual over. Right. right. Stop zooming because you don't zoom <laughs> on single cameras, but camera right. operators I, on multicams are taught to I constantly be making that shit. Oh, I hate a I, zoom. I, like, I can't stand, like, unless it's a fucking 70s black exploitation or, yeah, or, boom. You know, <laughs> fucking spy intrigue thriller, like refrain. I, I have a cam- I have rules for camera that I yeah. you know go and talk. And on the Pucky Brewster pilot, I was doing an insert close up of something, and I went, "Did you just zoom?" And the camera <laughs> operator, this crusty old guy I love, he was like, "Just three millimeters." And I was like, "It's a zoom," <laughs> and everybody's like, "You got busted." <laughs> Wait, um, I, I wanted to ask you in, in the mix of that, in the midst of that, are you now, if I'm an audience member for this live taping with your, with your, you know, pass where a camera's coming out and getting something different, are they now, is the viewer now subjected to seeing more takes? And is that like no. a fundamental difference? Okay. It's that, that's the, the trick is having a showrunner who gets what you're doing and goes, oh, you got the wides. You got uh-huh. that close up on the right side. A lot of showrunners want to see it within the same take, right? They, Every they, time. They do yeah. runs in multi cam. It's like, well, it didn't work in that one. I was like, no, but their close up was great. And so I would get ahead of it by talking to the showrunners and going, this is what I'm going to do. Because in front of a live audience, you don't want a writer going, what the, you know, so you're always going, are you good with that close up? of Punky from X camera. She was great in that scene, right? Great. Right. So this next one, you're not going to see that. And now A is going up. So you're doing the same amount of takes, but you just have to be very methodical with what coverage right. you've gotten and know that. Uh, so the zooms, the boom. Oh, this is a funny story. So out max, they get high in the basement to get away from their smart kids, right? Jason Biggs and Maggie. And I was like, this, this got to be a basement. A basement has a ceiling. And most sitcoms, right, you never right, see a ceiling, right? right? You right, see a chandelier right. hanging down. So I got in early with the production designer. We came up with an idea for a half ceiling so that we could do wides and we could go deep uh-huh. and talk to lighting. And we were going to use practicals. This DP Joe who won, won, he did Punky and he won an Emmy for it and thanked me because I, I let him light, you know, like right. dark and have shadows. I didn't let him, the network did. I fought for it, you know. Right. But the day before we're shooting, or a couple of days in, as they're loading in equipment, I see this guy with a big beard, older guy, and he just looks pissed. And he's walking around that basement. And I went up, I said, you're the sound mixer, aren't you? <laughs> and he said, who the hell built these sets? How am I going to get my mics in here? Did it? Like he was going there and he knows, like, you got to right. get that sound live in front of an audience. He right. Went, and I said, we've thought about that. And I, I sat down and I showed him where the ports were. I showed him where the practicals were lighting from. And I showed mm-hmm. him where we thought he could hide. And then he was like, oh, so I can hide mics here and you're okay. And we collaborate in a way that you don't usually do on a sitcom. Right. Um, and now we had a basement where you could go really low and look up and see a ceiling. And that makes it real, right? I try to show yeah. a ceiling or a door anywhere I can, a window, because then it's real. Otherwise, people walking in from nowhere, that yeah. that feels like a cheat to me. So I developed a bunch of those little techniques and you had to, and the network loved that idea. And so I've, I've done, a, I guess, three sitcom pilots that I, I think I got because I brought that style to it. Right, right. That's incredible, man. Like hats off to to make right. so many transitions and and each one to kind of get to 
what some would argue is the peak, which is being sought after to do the pilots and create a vision for a world. So that's amazing, man. Thank you. I feel very, I feel very, I've been very fortunate. You know, we have the best job in the world. I firmly believe that. Uh, yeah. So. So what do you think, what do you think's on the other side of this strike? When, when the WGA and sag after come to terms, like, do you have any feelings on what the industry will look like? I, I, I do. I will say that, and I don't know what you've experienced, and all my people who think they have inside information, it has been <laughs> absolutely wrong. And so this has been an unusual strike that way. I've been in a weird position where I, I've been co-show running and EPing and directing a show, a live action show in Albuquerque, called The Loud House, which is about a boy with 10 sisters. So it's this big over the top show. We built a neighborhood in a parking lot in Albuquerque. So it's like the opposite of the unreal I was doing where you like you build nothing real. Now I have a mini stage in Albuquerque that like I go, I need a house there and it's built. It's it's very surreal. Our job sometimes when you ask for something and it happens, you're like, oh, my God. But we had we did a movie in March, which actually is coming out in a couple of weeks, a Halloween movie. But we had tw- a 20 episode order for the second season. And our showrunner, writer, Tim Hobart, and his team got eight scripts in the can, but by May 1st. So our plan was, you know, to go there. And I'm while I'm in the Writers Guild, I don't function as a writer on this show at all. So I'm a director right. showrunner. So we were able to we were one of the few productions that was legally allowed to keep working. You know, we. It was tricky. There were things you knew were working in the script and, you know, and the writers knew it too, but they just had to give us those cards and we had to, you know, we couldn't change those cards at all. We had to keep shooting. So we got seven done. We got seven done by July 10th when the the actor strike uh, shut us down. And and then, you know, I've been out picketing and and talking with people too. I'm worried about two things. The one thing I'm really worried about is the below the line crew. Mm-hmm. which is one of the reasons I was working so hard to keep us working. Cause I, I was like, this strike's going to go long. And if you guys have to start working in May, you know, yeah. these are people who they don't have contracts. They have day to day that, you know, they're going to suffer their insurance. That's mm-hmm. a big thing right now, which is they're not going to have insurance and the pandemic, they already went into their bank with their unions insurances. So that's something we got to figure out for sure, because those, they are the reason we are able to make the shows we make. Right. I have a secret hope. I, I develop and and pitch stuff too, mostly in the kids and family world, but some streamers. And for the last two years, it's been nothing but it's got to be existing IP. It's got to be a franchise. It's got to be a reboot. Right. And that's been creatively very stifling. No one wants to hear a new idea. And I, even though I still hear from the people that that's still their mandate because that's the world now. You know, we want a SpongeBob live action series. We don't want to another right. series we want to cash in on spongebob and i'm very lucky because uh, loud house is based on a seven season animated show so it is a franchise which is why we're able to i think stay up as a live action show even though we're very successful right but i'm kind of hoping that maybe there's a reshuffling and a reset button and they need product so that they do go you know that script that you had, you know, let's look at it because it's done and it's ready. And maybe we need something and maybe we'll take a chance. I, I don't know. I, I hesitate even saying that because I, that's such a long shot. That would be a good reset, I think. I also fear that there's going to be less production for a little while. And yeah. we already have, we have great television, but shorter episode orders already, you know. So as a director, selfishly, where there would be 22 golden tickets for a season. Now there's eight. And and thankfully, they're recognizing directors as, as auteurs and getting them in early and giving them a lot of episodes, which they should. You know, if you have a eight episode, very specific series, right. like get that vision behind it the whole time. So that's less and less spots for directors, you know, yeah. and that I, that I think is definitely going to happen. That's been happening already. I know a lot of talented people who are realizing that you know, they are not working as much or maybe, you know, retiring. I'm never going to do that because I'm going to create something like I, my hustle is always like, okay, I'll make up something that I'll shoot myself. And you can do that. Yeah. You know, you don't need a film camera. You can make something put it on YouTube. I feel like that's the, that's the only insurance that I can prepare. You know what I mean? Like 
okay, like I can, I can, I can write something. I can find a writer to write something and use some director money to option it. You know what I mean? Like, like these are the things that give us as directors in particular a fighting chance. And I think that, I think everyone in their respective crafts has something that has some way that they can find to, 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 you know, diversify the, and, and, and better yet, even exploit themselves. Like, but I think that's what it's got to come down to because they're, they just, the companies seem to just want to turn the faucet off, you know, when it's not even dripping and, and make sure that everything, you know, it's about, it's about growth. It's not about act, the, the actual business itself. It's about saying we grew in this quarter, whether or not that it's real or not, you know? Where, where did that, I, I think about that a lot. Why do we have to keep growing exponentially? You know, like that's a, a last 50 years kind of thing, like company. And now that these are giant companies, so they have to yeah. show that growth. But that's not how film and TV works. If Barry Diller had a the one thing I saw recently where he was saying that the studios and networks, the traditional networks who have right. sold their soul and said, we're streamers, right? And right. now they're like, streaming doesn't make money. Commercials actually makes money. That was what was lucrative. He's right. saying break off from Netflix, Apple, and uh, yeah. Amazon, two companies that don't care about television, right? They're a shipping company and a computer company. And then Netflix, right. which is a, is a filmmaking company, but they have a different model, like make a deal, go back to what you know, and let the streamers figure out that. And that, that sounds smart. I don't see that happening. Right. But a big reason I got into, besides being given the opportunity to do the Unreal stuff, was like, no one, I, I saw something where I was like, okay, this is the future, I think. Not It's not going to replace everything, but it's definitely there. And I've done something that very few people have done. And that makes me, I want to continue telling stories as long as I can. So, right. And I like the way stories are told in Unreal. Uh, right. it, it, it feeds the live action director in me, you know? Right. So I'm going to try to exploit that. And I've been and done a few projects in it. And I know people who are playing in it and I, I hope that, you know, for me as a director does make a couple more opportunities than I might not have had if I, you know, just stuck purely in live action. So, right. Well, this is the martini. Uh, right. It's a, it's a three part martini. So feel free to, you know, grapple with the question. <laughs> All right. Um, but because I have the pleasure of having someone with such a wide range of experience and, Knowing, you know, I, I'm a subscriber to the to the to the saying, you know, sorry for the long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. <laughs> uh, don't feel the need to be like, you know, soundbitey. But if you could take the bait and funnel, distill the best, the most important skill for a director to have for children's TV, for comedy. And for drama, I think that would benefit okay. listeners very much. Wow, this, I feel like I'm on Final Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm even writing down children's comedy, drama, the one skill. Yeah. All right. Um, well, as you know, I'll, I'll start with the non-answer answer, which is what I think makes a director the most complete director is having many skills. Like I, you can't go into one skill and... What I've heard a lot on sets, especially multicam, I'll, I'll point this out, because I think single cam, you're a filmmaker, you're a filmmaker, you made your short films, you know, mm -hmm. you made Black Card, which by the way, I watched and really enjoyed last mm -hmm. night, but you Thank had to you. figure all that out, right? Sitcoms, there's a bunch of people figuring it out, and as a director, you just kind of need to be in there sometimes, and there's a big team to support that. So I get a lot, especially on sitcom sets, you know, camera, you know, working with actors and you know how to, you know, writing, you know, you know how to, it all ties together and you know, post. And I was like, isn't that what the definition of a director, like camera actors, right. storytelling and post, like those are the four things that you got to do. But in some of our mediums, you don't have to, you could be a great acting coach who is very great, is incredible with the actors, but doesn't really know the cameras. And there's a camera coordinator who, you know, hopefully you'll learn that and do it. Right. So like 
the big skill you have is diversity of skills. So that's just the easy blanket answer. Like you need to know a lot of things because you need to know what everybody on that set is doing so that when you make a decision, you know how it affects them and then can fight for what you want. So like when I say, hey, I'm going to bring the camera up there to the left, the DP goes, well, I don't have lighting here. Da, da, da. And you can say, no, no, can't you just swing that around? You know, not tell them their job, but know enough right. that it's not just like shoot that now, you know. But to get very specific, the one skill I think is the most important in children's is patience mm. and pers- patience and persistence. I'll call I'll get them in there under the double P's because <laughs> it's it's not going to happen the first time a lot of times. And it, it, it's not going to Diane Weiss like, hey, we're doing this scene. You rehearse it once and then she kills it. And hopefully you had the cameras on it the right way. Right. Right. It is a young person who's learning their craft, who maybe doesn't hit their marks, who maybe is mumbling, who didn't hit their marks so the camera missed them. You know, like you have to have patience, but you also got to get it in a short amount of time. So you got to be persistent. You can't just go, okay, that was good enough. So that's children. Comedy is timing, timing, timing. It really, you got to have an ear for comedy and an ear for the specific comedy you've worked you worked on Mythic Quest, which I am director jealousy like crazy. I love, love that show Mythic was fun. Quest. Those and, guys are funny as hell. And the pace, and but a different yeah. pace, you know, a very different pace from the other shows you've done. But most shows on television, a different pace, like a different, different vibe, right? So you got to hear that and know what the, I, I call it the music. I got this actually from the star of Lazy Town, the creator of Lazy Town. He's like, you have to hear the music of the scene. This scene is da 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 And I use that a lot, especially with young actors, because they'll just say the lines. I was like, no, the scene isn't this. It's bomb, bomb, da da da. And then, because I don't like to give line readings, as most directors don't. Right. But I will give emphasis and emotion readings, and I'll say the other words or I'll sing it. Like, you're the piccolo, you know? So it's... Bum, 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 bum. See how that's funny? And they'll go, oh, I get it. So right, then they'll deliver right. the line that way. So hearing the music of the scene in comedy, the pacing and timing, I think is really important. Some people have it, some don't. But you can learn it. You know, you yeah. watch a bunch of the shows, you watch great comedy, and you just hear that rhythm. And you need to create it in editing, too. Whereas I think some people don't get it exactly right on set. And as I'm EPing and getting cuts in from directors, I'm like, Oh, but that, and then you tweak it. That's what editing is for. And suddenly that rhythm is there and it's 17% funnier. So that's comedy. Drama is having a vision, like not just going in and, and going, okay, they're in this room and the cameras are here. It's like, what is the, what is the pathos of the scene and Mm -hmm. how am I going to start it and end it? I think that's, that's more important than comedy and drama, you know, because Comedy, it's a lot of times, especially half hour about the words, right? And a lot of showrunners will just be like, that's not how I heard it. That's all they want to hear. It doesn't matter that the camera looked great over there. That wasn't a funny line. Whereas drama, you can sit and have someone go, wow, that you did that in a wide shot French reverse over their shoulders. And that scene is so much better than if you were in the front of them with their faces. And you so... That's, I don't know if I have a one word for that, but it's, it's, that's, I think, what's most important in drama Mm -hmm. than the other genres. Yeah, it sounds like, and not to put words in your mouth, but it's like, there's, there's the timing and I'm going with the alliteration. I love the the double P, um, (laughs) patience and persistence. Then there's timing, timing, timing. And then maybe in the T category, the drama stuff, there's the technical can, can, can elevate, but not, but it's not tech. Technical really isn't needed in comedy. And I, these are broad sweeping statements, you know what I mean? Yes. I, but like, but like you're saying, like the words are so much more important that like you, and you can't make someone laugh at something that's not funny, but you can do something technically in a drama and turn a lever to enhance and elevate whatever drama is there. I, I, Yes, it's technical tied like it's it's the t- I think technical is the best of it. Technical tied to a style, a, yeah. a tone, technical and tone maybe if we want to keep yeah. in the you know alliteration, technical and tone like have some technical choices that 
create the right tone in a drama. So this is film school right here, folks. It really is. I, I, I think that there's been first, it's been a pleasure rapping with you, man. And this is awesome. You Thank know, you. I think there's a lot of a lot of gems in there that people can take away. And I, I always feel like it's that's about the most prescriptive that I think we get, you know, these kind of final questions about like, what do you think it is? You know, boom, boom, boom. But but in reality, it kind of I know sometimes people listen and and they'll say, OK, like, what what do I do with that? But I think it is like it is as simple as what you've stated. It is as simple as remembering when shit's going haywire on that children's set, like patience will get you your shot. <laughs> yeah. Your patience will keep you calm so you don't lose the next job because you lose <laughs> your shit when, you know, maybe you should, but you forgot Jonathan said patience and that would have been the way to get through day two of his shoot. So yeah, man, it's it's really good. Thank you. This, is, this has been a blast and, you know, I would love to do it with a real drink sometime and then hear more about like your journey too, because it's very impressive. Nah, man. Well, let's do it. My drink is currently Mezcal, so Ooh. we can we can make that happen. Uh, All right. Hopefully we'll be on, I, I think the that in addition to, you know, I'm prepping and you're up next on some drama back to back, I feel like that'll be the perfect All right, combination. Let's, let's put that in the universe when directors exactly. cross. That's always the place. That would be awesome. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you, brother. Appreciate your time. Thank man. you. Peace. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on IG via at Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via let's shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is produced and edited by the multi-talented cut creator Tristan Nash. Assistant produced by the young mogul Jada George and features the wonderfully gifted Kelly McCreary as our announcer. It's written by yours truly, but I mostly come up with these questions on the fly, which you've probably noticed. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is sponsored by Sweat Equity, so go ahead and get your podcast swag via PeteChapman.com and leave a review on iTunes if so inclined. That shit matters. All right, y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed that interview with Jonathan Judge. Tune in next week for episode 58 as we welcome the director, Allison Liddy Brown. And in the meantime, stay safe, spread love, and keep creating.